Good morning, and welcome to the Cathedral Mary of the Assumption. Please rise and join in the gathering song. Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to introduce you to our guest homilist, visiting priest, and a man who has become in a, such a short time a friend. This is Father Bruno Piccolo, who will be speaking to us a bit later in the Mass. Let's welcome him. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. Today we continue our reading of the Gospel of John, where Jesus declares that he is the bread of life. Those who come to him cannot hunger. Those who believe in him, he says, will never thirst. And so as we prepare ourselves for this Eucharistic feast, we acknowledge our sins. We ask the Lord for pardon and for strength. I confess oh, to Almighty God, God and you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do. Through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray, pray for, for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. Christ have mercy. Christ have mercy. Lord, have mercy. 
mercy. Lord, have mercy. Let us pray. Draw near to your servants, O Lord, and answer their prayers with unceasing kindness, that for those who glory in you as their creator and guide, you may restore what you have created and keep safe what you have restored. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Exodus. The whole Israelite community grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, Would that we had died at the Lord's hand in the land of Egypt as we sat by our flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. But you had to lead us into the desert to make the whole community die of famine. Then the Lord said to Moses, I will now rain down bread from heaven for you. Each day the people are to go out and gather their daily portion. Thus will I test them to see whether they follow my instructions or not. I have heard of the grumbling of the Israelites. Tell them, in the evening twilight you shall eat flesh, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread so that you may know that I, the Lord, am your God. In the evening, quail came up and covered the camp. 
In the morning, a dew lay all about the camp, and when the dew evaporated, there on the surface of the desert were fine flakes like hoarfrost on the ground. On seeing it, the Israelites asked one another, What is this? For they did not know what it was. But Moses told them, This is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. The Lord gave them bread from heaven. 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 The things we have heard and understood the things our fathers have told us we will tell to the next generation the glories of the lord and his might and the marvelous deeds he has done the lord gave them bread from heaven the Lord gave them bread from heaven. He commanded the clouds above and opened the gates of heaven. He rained down manna to eat and gave them bread from heaven. The Lord gave them bread from heaven. The Lord gave them bread from heaven. Man ate the bread of angels. He sent them abundance of food. So he brought them to his holy land to the mountain his right hand had won. The Lord gave them bread from heaven. The Lord gave them bread from heaven. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, I declare and testify in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. 
That is not how you learned Jesus Christ, assuming that you have heard of him and were taught in him, as truth is in Jesus, that you should put away the old self of your former way of life, corrupted through deceitful desires, and be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and put on the new self, created in God's way in righteousness and holiness of truth. The word of the Lord. not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. When the crowd saw that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they themselves got into boats and came to Capernaum looking for Jesus. And when they found him across the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered them and said, Amen, amen, I say to you, you are looking for me not because you saw signs, but because you ate the loaves and were filled. Do not work for food that perishes, but for the food that endures for eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him the Father God has set his seal. So they said to him, what can we do to accomplish the works of God? Jesus answered and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he sent. So they said to him, what sign can you do that we may see and believe in you. What can you do? Our ancestors ate man in the desert as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. So Jesus said to them, amen, amen, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave the bread from heaven. My father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is that which comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. So said, he said, they said to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. 
I'm grateful to Father Prentice and to Deacon Gary and to all of you for this opportunity. You know, we never tire of speaking of what we love or who we love. And being a missionary, I love to speak about the missions. So Jesus said in the gospel of today, I am the bread of life. And at the end of his life, he said to the apostles, go all over the world and proclaim this truth that I am the bread of life. And so throughout the centuries, we see the church taking up this command of Jesus and meeting different cultures, different places, different people. And always, and you know the challenge is never easy. It's always a challenge in many ways because faith itself is our challenge. And so during this time of uh, ordinary time, as it's called, when we put the vestments in green, the kingdom of God is proclaimed. It's presented in different images, the seed, the flock, a building with uh, foundations, with uh, sidewalls and the roof, our marriage, the husband and wife, parents and children. So it's a constant uh, way of helping us. And myself, I asked at times if it's worth it to come to a church and preach about the missions and then disappear. But many of the people say, no, Father, even though it's once a year, we build like a mosaic. We have a missionary who speaks about Bolivia, another one who speaks about Cambodia, another one who speaks about South Africa, all the different realities of the church. And as you know, the world, politics and migrations change. And so even the reality of the missionary changes. In the past, the missionary would go and have a large territory, and the missionaries were the builders, the hard doctors, of course, the priests. They were everything. Now we go and we find local bishops, and uh, they ask us for specific tasks. Maybe it's to teach in the seminary, to take care of indigenous people, to care for people with disabilities. And so it's a different reality, but it's still the same in the sense that someone who is called needs to respond and needs to leave his family, his country, his culture, his language, and go. And so I will relate to you my own personal experience. And I think this way would be the easiest to understand who a missionary is. Not that it's new to you, but every story, it's unique. I am the youngest uh, child of nine, born in Padua, northern Italy. Padua might remind you of a saint. A saint you pray when you lose something. Anthony, no? And I say, I don't know how you pray, but my prayer goes like this. Tony, Tony, stick around. Something is lost and has to be found. <laughs> it never fails. I thought about being a priest when I made my first communion, September 8th, 1948. I was eight years old. And so <clears throat> in the morning, I received first communion. In the afternoon, the bishop came and confirmed us. I think it was a class of about 80, because after the war, some classes could not have the regular first communion and confirmation. And so they, some classes were lagged behind. They put them together. So as I received communion, I felt that invitation, be a priest. And I said, Jesus, in this town, there are three priests for 3,000 people. Priests were abundant then in Italy. Also, they feel the pinch now, the shortness of priests also in Italy. And so I said to Jesus, you see, there is an abundance of priests here. I'd like to be a missionary. Go to a place where you are not known or if you're known, there are no priests, no voices in my hearing. But in my heart, the response was, it's OK with me. And so as I finished grade school, I went on to high school seminary, to college, came to the States, and studied the last four years, what they call theological studies, in Memphis, Michigan. It's a small town between Detroit and Port Huron. Richmond would be the closest township. And we had the seminary, and I studied there 
and then I was ordained a priest there because our superior general was a bishop. Vatican II, 62, 63, 64, 65 in the falls. Every uh, fall, the bishops of the world, 2,500, met and they gathered in St. Peter's Basilica. So you can imagine 2,500 bishops like in an arena. And uh, in that time, they thought that some communities thought having a bishop as a superior general would have some advantages. Later on, it proved that he didn't. But since he was just elected, he was a bishop in Brazil, he said, I will ordain the class of this year. There were 19 of us, four in the States, one from England, uh, two from Italy, and one American, and then 15 in Italy, three from the South, and 12 from the North. And uh, <clears throat> I was ordained, and I went home for the first Mass, a big uh, celebration in town, and then I was assigned to the Philippines. I belong to the PIME Missionary Society. PIME does not stand for put in money every day. <laughs> Those are the Latin initials that fit in English and Spanish in uh, Italian, but not in English. Pontifical Institute Mission Exterarum is a word in Latin, foreign missions. So I'm sure you know Merino, they are the American priests, diocesan priests for the foreign missions. That's what we began with in 1850. In Milan, the Archbishop had a, an abundance of clergy, and the Pope of that time, Pius IX, now Saint Pius IX, told the Archbishop, open a seminary for the foreign missions, and he did. And so for 100 years, we were all Italians. We went to India, to China, to what is called Myanmar today, Burma, it used to be called. And then after 1949, 50, 132 members came out of China, Mao Zedong and communism. But hundreds, I would say thousands between priests and sisters left China in those years. And many were hoping to go back. You know, sometimes political situations change two or three years. But the Pope of the 1950s, Pius XII, said, uh, dear missionaries, don't dream too fast. Communism does not change so quickly. 78 years is the cycle. So go to other countries. If you don't want to learn real difficult languages, there are countries they call themselves Catholics, but they have no priests. Philippines, Mexico, Brazil. And so that's why PIME opened other missions. We have missions, as I said, in India, Bangladesh, Thailand, Cambodia, Philippines, Hong Kong, Japan, Papua New Guinea, a couple of missions in Africa, Cameroon, Ivory Coast, and Guinea-Bissau, and a good group was in Brazil, and now a few in Mexico, a few here in the States. And so I think the highest number we reached was 800, but now we are down to 400, and all those 400, as we began 34 years ago to accept candidates from the countries where we minister, I would say 100 are not Italians. But the reality of the missions is the ideal. So as a young missionary, I was in the Philippines. People were coming to the big city, Manila, to look for a better future, only to find themselves in shanties, like it happens in many cities of the world. Sao Paulo in Brazil, or um, what is that? Um, uh, Mexico City, and uh, I was assigned to a new parish. Pope Paul VI came to Manila in 1970 and was presented to him as a new pastor of an area of 30,000, 40,000 people, but uh, we were in an area of squatters. It was uh, land reclaimed from Manila Bay, and so the houses were on stilts, the sidewalks at times were planks, I myself, sometimes you get up from the bed and there was this much water under the bed. I had to put the boots on before I could walk around because the high tide. No electricity, no water, no road to speak of, a lot of violence, drugs, prostitution, alcoholism. I said, I cannot do much by myself. 
I asked the community sisters to come, and they did. At first, they would come during the day. They said, too dangerous at night. I couldn't argue with them. I knew that. But little by little, they found a piece of land. They could build a, a clinic, a center for training for girls to uh, learn to sew, to cook, to take care of their own uh, hygiene and the family. And so I could see the community coming. As a young person, I didn't think about my health as much. So go, go, go. At the end, I had to slow down. I had hepatitis. The liver needed to rest. So the doctor said, you might as well leave the Philippines at least for a few months and come back. Two brothers and a sister of mine immigrated to Australia. As you know, Australia ran out of wasps. You know, wasp, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestants. So they didn't want blacks, they didn't want Asians. <laughs> so they invited Polish, Greeks, Italian, Portuguese, and they would pay even for the trip to go to Australia. And uh, after the first three years, they would deduct a little bit from their salary every month. After three years, they were free birds. And so two brothers and a sister of mine went. And uh, I went down. I hadn't seen them in 20 years. It was good, especially my sister's place, to take care of uh, the food. And <laughs> she was like a mom to me, because when I was born, my mom had uh, Parkinson's. And she lived like that for 28 years. So I realized the great love that she had later on. As I was a child, sometimes I would say to my sisters, translate her, <laughs> and she would get upset. And uh, rightly so, now that I think. But as a child, you don't realize. After I went back to the Philippines, I was for a few months in the South, but then I was assigned to a parish with 60,000 people, two priests. And uh, we said, let's look for sisters or nuns. Many said, we do have vocations, but we have a lot of commitments. We are overextended. And so we cannot answer your invitation. So we said to the people, help us. And they did. I remember at the beginning, uh, since the parish had been abandoned for 10, 15 years, many children were not baptized. So the pastor said, well, OK, the feast of the parish, Immaculate Conception, December 8th, we will do all the baptisms. You know how many we did? 400. <laughs> So we did them in groups of 60s, 70s. We asked the mom to hold the baby, so if they need to be fed, whatever. One priest read the ritual, and the others were doing the actions. You know, the, the frost on the forehead, on the chest. When he came to pour in the water, jokingly, I said, we called in the fire truck and hosed the kids down. <laughs> it was uh, very hard and very committed. But it was very rewarding because since we didn't have the sisters, we said to the people, come. And we began with a group of men, about 12, and read the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark has all the issues that a Christian community faces, including the people who are different, administering the goods, caring for the elderly or the orphans or disabled. And little by little, I could see these men one was a lawyer, one was a doctor, one was a bus driver, public transportation driver, another was a farmer. But uh, there was a flood because we were close to a lake, and 800 families were without house for a few months. Little by little, then the water receded. But these people came together and provided, and uh, they got organized. So, it was beautiful. And then the women became catechists. The youth became leaders in tournaments, activities for the youth. And so I was uh, really excited and enthusiastic in the language. I spoke like them. So I felt very good. I had studied five months Tagalog. But the superior said, we need you back in the States. You know English. You have been there. So I was in Chicago for uh, eight years with young men preparing to become missionaries themselves. Some are still in the mission. Some have gone to the dioceses. They felt the missions was a big challenge. Some even left the priesthood, both for you, married, for us priests. Perseverance is not a given. We have to work at it. We have to work and to grow. 
After eight years there, a pastor in Los Angeles, where we had a parish, died of heart attack. And the older priest was with him. He said, I will not be alone, and I don't want to be the pastor. So if you want to keep the parish, send someone. <laughs> so the superior looked around and eventually asked me. I said, well, if you want, but I need to learn a bit of Spanish. There are some Spanish words in uh, Tagalog in the Filipino language, and Italian is very close, but any language you have to study a little bit. I had three weeks in San Antonio at the MAC, Mexican American Cultural Center, and then they said, we need you here, and so sink or swim. As missionary, <laughs> you make do with what you have. But there again, it was very rewarding. South Central LA, I jokingly I said, I bought the bulletproof vest and the helmet. I was held the knife point myself. Give me your car keys, your wallet. Here it is. In those situations, what you have to save is life. Everything else can be replaced, not life. I noticed in this parish every Friday evening there was a youth group. They came together and sang, Hallelujah, praise the Lord, and they were singing. I said, You need three things for a Christian community prayer, study, and action. And so it's good that we come together to pray, but we also need some conferences. So we invite a doctor to speak about abortion, about the issues of life, parents to speak about how they relate it to their teenage children, a policeman to speak about drugs and gangs. And so little by little, the young people were coming alive. I had chosen four young men, four young women, to be like leaders. And I met with them again for the Gospel of Mark every Sunday evening, though I was dead tired, but I spent an hour, an hour and a half, and they were really curious. Afterwards, maybe we went out for pizza or ice cream, but even now, if I go, happen to go back to LA, some of them married with children, all the challenges, but I see that the roots of their desire to know better the faith, to commit themselves to the Christian community, was a powerful experience. After that, I went in, in uh, Mexico, in Acapulco. I was just for one year with the indigenous people who were called Mixtecos. I couldn't learn the language. With Spanish, we could communicate. But after that year, they said, we need you back in the States. So I was in Detroit responsible for our community, both in Mexico and here in the States. And uh, I was there for 10 years. After that, I said, I need a sabbatical. And they said, where would you like to go? Well, I'd like to go near Florence. There is a community of 100, 1,000 people. 75 nations are represented there. Families, religious, priests, sisters. And so it was a powerful experience of a Christian community, of a movement. And after that, the superior said, your mission is Italy. I said, are you sure? He says, yes. After 45 years being outside of my country, I felt like a foreigner. <laughs> I was so used to the States. But uh, looking back, I was there for 12 years. I accompanied a couple of brothers and a sister of mine who died during those years. But I also visited shrines, historical sites, enjoyed the food, Italy has a richness of culture and history that uh, many of you have gone and want to go back because of that. So in hindsight, I get, thank God for that opportunity. In 2017, the superior said, would you go back to the States? You have double citizenship. So I said, sure, what is there for me? I, he said, well, there is a parish in Manhattan with Hispanics, Puerto Ricans, Domini Dominicans, and the pastor is from India, is one of ours, so you can help, and so I did. And last year, from New York, I moved back to Detroit. That's where I came from yesterday. So I'm grateful also to be in this beautiful church. I love stained glass windows, so I like to look at them and realize the power of the image. We use television and all that today, but also the church in the Middle Ages had this wealth of richness. I ask you three things and I close. First, don't take your faith for granted. 
As I realized doing this, that I'm doing Mission Appeal, I was in Minnesota, I was in Ohio, I was in Southern Indiana, I was in Boston, I noticed that people are coming to the Catholic faith from other traditions. They're converts. And I'm really impressed. I always ask them, what attracted you? The Eucharist, the community, the, the fullness of the history of the church. Father Prentice says, John Paul II, the Pope, who was a, ja a man who was really good to do the Pope, to be the Pope. <laughs> so it's interesting to see that uh, the church will never die. Jesus said to Peter, you are the rock, and on this rock I will build my church. And so let us live it with the aspects that I mentioned, prayer, study, and action. Second, be missionaries yourselves. I'm sure there are many opportunities also here to contribute to the parish in different activities. Reach out to families, uh, visit the elderly, care for the youth and the children and orphans. There are so many opportunities. Whatever you can or in your profession, be that presence of love. Pray for priests and sisters. As I said, it's not a given to persevere, and vocations are scarce all over the world. We need to pray. Jesus said, the harvest is plentiful. Pray to the master of the harvest to send the laborers. Thirdly, after communion, there will be a second collection. You know the needs of the missionaries are many, and I'm sure you have your own needs, and COVID has not done a good job to anybody in the world. <laughs> so I understand. You might say, I'm not able to contribute a lot. Whatever you contribute, you can contribute. God will see your generosity and reward you. Thank you. Amen. Please join me as we declare in God's presence those things that we believe. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. I believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, consubstantial with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us, men and power of salvation, he came down from heaven, and by the Holy Spirit was incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son is adored and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and I look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With deep confidence that we are the beloved children of the Lord, we present to the Lord the things that we need. May international, national, state, and local government leaders turn to the Lord when faced with the grumbling of so many concerns which they face each day. May they grow in reverence for God and uniting the hopes and desires of people with his providential love. We pray to the Lord. Lord we are for those participating in Mass today, for those present here or via live stream, may our hearing the gospel and receiving the sacraments from our hearts in a personal relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For workers in hospital and care facilities, for those in emergency services and law enforcement, 
for those who care for others in their homes and among their neighborhoods. May they place the weariness of serving before the Lord, seeking his consolation alone. We pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For youth and young people, for the grandparents and the elders whose wisdom is an example of holiness and for all families. May this period of reliance on family provide young people spiritual insight and interior strength in a world with many challenges and distractions. We pray to the Lord. Lord for those in the Book of Life in this cathedral parish and those who have died among our own family and friends, may our participation in Mass and our good works be offered in prayer for them that they may be received into eternal life. We pray to the Lord. Father, we thank you for the privilege of access that we have to you. And with great confidence, we place all our needs now in your hands, thanking you in advance for every prayer that will be answered through Christ our Lord. Amen. Pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Grace. 
Graciously sanctify these gifts, O Lord, we pray. And accepting the oblation of this spiritual sacrifice, make of us an eternal offering to you. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord, our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, almighty and eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For out of compassion for the waywardness that is ours, he humbled himself and was born of the Virgin. By the passion of the cross, he freed us from unending death, and by rising from the dead, he gave us life eternal. And so with angels and archangels, with thrones and dominions, and with all the hosts and powers of heaven, we sing the hymn of your glory as without end we acclaim. You are indeed holy, O Lord, the fount of all holiness. Make holy, therefore, these gifts, we pray, by sending down your Spirit upon them like the dewfall, so that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. At the time he was betrayed and entered willingly into his passion, he took bread and, giving thanks, broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and once more giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until we come again. Therefore, as we celebrate the memorial of his death and resurrection, we offer you, Lord, the bread of life and the chalice of salvation, giving thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence and minister to you. 
Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Humbly we pray that partaking of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world. Bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis our Pope and Robert our Bishop and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Grant unto them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray. Then with the blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with the blessed Joseph, your spouse, with the blessed Apostle, and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him and with him and in him, O oh God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. For the, For the kingdom, kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you. My peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your spirit. Let us offer one another the sign of peace. The peace of Christ.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, Lord I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word and my soul shall be healed. this bread we share the body of our Lord is not this wine we drink the blood of Christ outpours one bread one body one cup one call one faith one spirit present in our soul My strength I'll always give.
Let us pray. Accompany with constant protection, O Lord, those you renew with these heavenly gifts, and in your never-failing care for them, make them worthy of eternal redemption. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Special thanks to Father Bruno for both his ministry. This man's been a priest for 56 years. If you're like me, you just love that missionary heart that's still burning with fervor to see every soul on the face of the planet experience a life-changing encounter with Jesus Christ. So, Father, thanks be to God for you, for the Pine Brothers, and for your ministry. We're delighted to have you with us. I'm going to ask that as we do our closing blessing, you'll just sit down for a few important announcements we want to share with you, and uh, then we'll all be free to leave. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life. Thanks be to God.